Welcome to the world's number one fitness business podcast for health club owners, gym managers, and fitness entrepreneurs. As always, this will be a great show as we have another expert to help your fitness business and your career. We'd like to thank our premier sponsor, Active Management, for supporting us. And we highly recommend becoming a member of Active Management to strengthen your business in 2016. There are loads of resources members receive, so join the Active Tribe today at www.activemgmt.com.au. Now that's enough from me. Let's welcome the show's amazing host, Chantal. What's on this week's show? Hi, everybody, and welcome along to this week's show. We have reached week four of our most downloaded guests from the last 12 months. And this week, I was so excited to welcome back the amazing Bill McBride. Last time I caught up with Bill, it was way back in show six when we talked about what to look for in club managers, purchasing habits of consumers, and critical components of a strategic plan. This time when we caught up, Bill takes us through the rise of the medical fitness center. We talk about what it means, what it looks like, and steps that you can take if you want to enter that space. We discuss an article that he wrote about creating new programs to follow a fad versus evolving our traditional offerings, and he gives us his thoughts and insights on that topic. He also gives us tips on hiring and interviewing people for your team and some great advice for managing staff. All of that and much more to come. Now, also in this week's show, we are joined by our people expert, Lisa Klebe, and she talks to us about communicating change to your staff and your members, and she's got some really great advice on that, so make sure that you stay tuned to hear that one. Tribe, this week's sponsor shout-out goes to Rex Roundtables. To find out about information about how you can become a member, check out www.rexroundtables.com. Also, don't forget, during June and July, we have a very special birthday present for you all from our wonderful friends at Active Management. If you haven't already claimed your gift, make sure you stay tuned right to the end of the show to hear what you need to do. This month, we have an awesome prize for people who subscribe to the show notes at www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com or engage with the Fitness Business Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or even emailing us. Do it and you may be this month's winner. Now it's time for this week's guest. Okay, Bill, are you ready to fit spy our global FBP tribe of fitness business owners and managers? Absolutely. Can't wait. And are you ready to overload them with your pearls of wisdom, your strategies for success and tips to make them better leaders and business people? I'm absolutely ready to give it my best shot. Okay, let's go for it. Now, try Bill McBride is the president and chief executive officer of Active Wellness, Active Sports Clubs and BMC3. Bill is a health club industry veteran with over 25 years of experience leading and managing all aspects of commercial health clubs, medical fitness centres, residential, community, multi-tenant and corporate fitness sites. He co-founded Active Sports Clubs and Active Wellness, LLC, and owns a health club consultancy, BMC3. Bill has served as chairman of URSA, board of directors, president of the Mid-Atlantic Club Management Association, and served on the industry advisory board for the American Council of Exercise. He's actively engaged as an author on industry education, serves on several advisory boards and speaks regularly on industry topics throughout the world. And Bill was formerly a guest with us back on show six, way back 12 months ago. And it is such an absolute pleasure to welcome you back to the show, Bill. Welcome back. Thank you, Chantelle. I'm so excited to be back. This past year went very quickly, it so I'm did. very much It did go very quickly. Now, you have an absolutely incredible bio, and I feel very, very blessed to that you've you know agreed to come back and, and do the show once again, Bill. I've just gone through your bio, I've shared that with everyone, and, and if they tuned into Show 6 previously, they would have got some of the insights into your experience and, and what you've achieved in your career already so far. It sounds incredible. I mean, surely there must have been a couple of roadblocks or hurdles on your road to success. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> How many do you want? <laughs> Maybe just share one with us. <laughs> the biggest roadblock or hurdle or challenge, if you if you would, you know, I was with an organization for 11 years. I was the president, chief operating officer. I had moved actually to California to work for this group. 
and and that was Club One. And in 2013, you know, it had some strategic differences with the board and uh, and the direction of the company and direction of what we should be doing. And and through those conversations of, of alignment and strategy, uh, I exited the organization amicably, but it was hard to leave something that you were passionate about with people you love that you committed 11 years to and, and, and you really, really wanted to make work. So when I left Club One, you know, I left and, and was unemployed. Uh, that's when I started BMC3, the consulting business. I actually did some consulting with Club One uh, upon my departure. But that experience of going from, you know, basically running an organization as the president COO of 2,000 or so employees with sites all over the country to not having an organization uh, other than myself to manage was very challenging and very dramatic of a shift and caused me to, to look inside and, and determine what I really wanted to do with my career and, and the next chapter. And so, you know, that was probably one of the biggest things that I had to work through and overcome and, and get clear about with the future direction, you know, and the, and the story so far is working out, you know, I spent a year or so building the consultancy business and then with the original founder, that had exited the company a long time ago, Jill Kenny, and, and a former CFO that worked with me, Carrie White. We launched Active Sports Clubs, which manifested into Active Wellness. Actually went back and purchased most of the assets of Club One, and uh, and now we're, we're on our way to building a nice company. But leaving in 2013 and that year of transition had, had quite a bit of, uh, of internal growth and uncertainty. And so that would be the first thing that comes to mind when you ask me that question. Thank you so much for sharing that, Bill. And I think it just it reinforces and goes to show all of us that, you know, even with, with great success, you you always face those challenges along the road. Bill, last time we caught up, we talked about a range of topics, but, you know, we were talking about teams and we we're talking about strategic planning. What would you say is your kind of current area of focus? I mean, right now, the current focus for me internally is is people performance, people enhancement with regard to their skill set, professional development, helping people on our team uh, grow and and continue to grow and and have opportunities for advancement, have opportunities for personal development. You know, one of the most fulfilling things that I've enjoyed throughout my career is continuously learning and having opportunities to to learn and try new things. So, so right now people performance and and helping individuals on our team, you know, get better and and do things that they really are passionate about doing. Um, That's something that I'm I'm focused quite a bit on as well as growing, you know, our business model through, through the human resources of great people working, working with us. Just how important is it to have great people in your, in your business, Bill? Well, I mean, we all say it and it's, it always sounds cliche, you know, we're in the people business, but it really is the, the secret sauce and it, it really is the only thing that you have. I mean, an organization is a legal entity, you know, created with paperwork, you know, people are what give it life. People are what give it breath. People are what deliver. And you're only as good as your people, you know, any customer service experience that you ever read about that goes wrong it's the brand is tarnished by something that went wrong with that interaction or the brand is made and, and, and coveted as a star based on, on the, the interactions of a person or people. So, you know, it truly is the, the, the most important thing that we look at. And, and in our business of, of health clubs, fitness centers, studios, leisure centers, people, you know, not just our own teams, but, but, it's about the people that are our members and our clients that come to see us to, to be supported and having their life, you know, uh, improve. So, you know, this, this broad topic of people, you know, is huge. And, and I, I think that, you know, we all say that we all feel that, but how do you execute and, and come up with, with ways that it really manifests itself in, in, into some structure that, that lets people thrive? Bill, you recently shared an article called The Rise of the Medical Fitness Centre and you touched earlier on active wellness. For anyone that's not familiar with the business, I'm hoping, first of all, that you can maybe just give us a little bit more insights into the structure of active wellness because I know that the subject of combining fitness and wellness solutions is is really something that is 
of great interest to a number of our tribe members and something that you've been able to execute. So do you want to start off maybe by telling us a little bit about Active Wellness, how that works and alignments perhaps with, I believe, your new strategic and financial partner? Sure. Uh, Active Wellness is a management services company. So we manage fitness delivery in lots of different scenarios. We manage in corporate fitness uh, centers. We manage in residential fitness centers. We manage in multi-tenant where an office park might have several companies and they share a combined fitness center. We'll manage those types of things. We also manage these things called medical fitness centers or medical wellness centers. Typically, they're owned by a hospital, a healthcare provider group. In the United States, most of most of the hospitals are nonprofit, and so with the shifts in in healthcare and how you know treatments are delivered with regard to payments and and the importance of outcomes, the hospitals are now taking another fresh look at their medical wellness and medical fitness offerings. You know, there was a surge in the '80s of these types of hospital-owned medical uh, commercial fitness centers that served the communities in which the hospital served. And so from a hospital's perspective, it's part of their cause of of impacting the health and well-being of the communities they serve. You know, so there's a brand recognition piece. There's a mission driven piece of of making people in the community healthier. And then there's also the affiliation of upstream patient referrals into the hospital system where appropriate. So, you know, that's the kind of the circumstance of, of these fitness centers. Um, they vary. Uh, several of them, most of them have some type of medical integration where there's medical offices on site or there's uh, cardiac rehab working through the main fitness function or there's orthopedic uh, services working through the main fitness function. So there's specialty um, rehab and, and treatment that that sometimes is at a higher level than a traditional fitness delivery for somebody without such conditions. So it's a different animal, but it's very related to to the regular animal, if you will, of, of, of upscale health clubs or premium fitness centers. So I think that when you look at the continuum of fitness, wellness, medicine, you know, and, and as that kind of continuum or wellness, fitness, and medicine, depending on how you want to define wellness. You know, you're looking at the commercial fitness center as we know it tends to be very focused on sales, marketing, engagement, enjoyment, a a much more customer service focus, Mm -hmm. whereas the medical fitness centers historically have been more clinical, more medically science-based, a medical overture, if you will. And, and what we're looking to do at Active with our clients that we support is kind of bring those worlds together in a fashion where the, the, the medical fitness commercial health club is appealing, engaging, customer service focused, but yet has those medical integrated programs for those special populations of, that are needed, as well as prevention, general wellness, general fitness, you know, so people can avoid getting to chronic condition stages. So I think there's a there's an opportunity for for these two to learn from each other and create an even better product. And, and that's kind of what we're working on. Um, how do we learn from various models to create a, a better product for, uh, for the customer? Bill, for any of our tribe out there that perhaps are gym owners, studio owners, who might have a more of a traditional fitness model but are interested in exploring moving into that wellness space or incorporating that into their business, what would you recommend would be the first step for them to take? I mean, the very first step that an operator should look at is their members. How many doctors, how many physical therapists, how many medical professionals do they have in their membership base currently? And starting with those relationships, because those people already trust the club, those people already have a relationship with the team. So starting with those, and then in the U.S., several operators have, have implemented uh, what's called a PrEP program or, or PrEP, which is you know physician-referred exercise program. And, and what that looks like is the club forms relationships with physicians groups, healthcare providers, 
to refer patients to the club. Typically, it's a it's a 90 day program, introductory you know pricing you know X dollars for 90 days beginning and end that you work with the person based on the doc's recommendation. So docs referring their patients to do some activity in, in, in a structured program with a, a fitness or leisure center. So that that's, you know, easy or, or not easy, but, but the easiest beginning first step. How many of these folks do I have a ready relationship? Because it really comes down to the site's credibility in the eyes of the medical community for, for this piece of this. So the prep program relationship with the current docs. The other piece is what's the environment for physical therapy? You know, are there physical therapists? Is there an opportunity to sublet physical therapy space in the site or have physical therapy programs, uh, lunch and learns and guest speakers, bringing the medical community on site to educate your staff and your members on, on new things that they need to be aware of with regard to wellness and prevention and, and, and disease management in certain aspects. So, you know, if I were starting from zero, the first step would be form a relationship with the physician and healthcare community in your local area. That's great advice. Thank you very much. Now, I was recently reading an article that you wrote called Creation Versus Evolution, and I just wanted to share with our listeners the opening sentence to that because I think that that this is such a highly relevant topic for all of us at the moment. And, And you write in the article, do we create completely new programs to follow trends and possibly fads? Or do we stay fresh on our current traditional offering while evolving with elements of efficacy from new technologies and consumer adopted preferences? It's a great article and I should I probably should have asked you first, if you don't mind, if we maybe share that with everyone on our show notes this week, Bill, because I think that they'll get a lot out of that article. Do you want to maybe uh, perhaps give us a little bit of an overview of that article and talk to us about your thoughts around this, you know, do we create these new programs, you know, or do we evolve with the elements of, of existing? Yeah, thank, thank you for, for that. I appreciate the compliment on the article. And yes, I'd love you to share it with whoever's interested. Thank you. The article stemmed from thoughts I had internally with debates that we're having with our teams and, and debates that I'm having in my own head with myself. You know, what what is solid that's always going to be here and is a practice that, that has longevity and will stay. And what is a trend and then what is a fad that's just gonna, gonna fade away. And, and we're all, you know, in the U S getting excited about all of these various models, the high intensity interval training models, the heart rate models, which I'm a big believer in the various studios, the specialized offerings around every modality that you can imagine, you know, yoga, boxing, cycle, In Australia and and throughout the world, you know, these same trends are occurring. They're not specific to the U.S. market. So, you know, what's happening is is there's the specialization uh, and segmentation of offerings to to various groups. And and to use your word, you know, they are, in effect, uh, each trying to create a tribe around around those those offerings. Mm. So. When we look at, at traditional corporate fitness centers, traditional commercial fitness centers, traditional medical fitness centers, in our portfolio, we go, okay, what do we want to do with regard to evolving current programming to keep it fresh and take advantage of new science and new learning and new efficacy? And, and what do we want to add in that is is completely creating a whole new approach all of some of the, the new models that are out there and, and, and some of the combinations. So the, the, the genesis of the article was, was that debate. And I think the answer for, for us is, is yes to both. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater on things that you do well and that your members have come to expect and appreciate, but always be pushing to make sure that you're evolving and growing and, and making the program more progressive more engaging. And so, you know, we're, we're basically looking at doing both improving our core offerings, but also trying some new things, um, experimenting with new ideas and trying some new things. Uh, does that answer it somewhat? Yeah, it does. It does. There's one particular thing that I'm 
wanting to uh, to know a little bit more about because you actually mentioned, and I haven't heard this term before, LIIT, low intensity interval training. And you suggest that perhaps that's an opportunity for, for fitness business owners. Tell us more about low intensity interval training. Yeah, I mean, low intensity interval training is is I'm starting to hear more and more about it, and you have various populations. This is this is a program that that might have some efficacy and attractiveness to uh, obese individuals. This is a program that might have efficacy and attraction to people with joint injuries or arthritis. This is the type of program that might have a lot of appeal for um, seniors that aren't currently active or haven't remained active at the levels that you would do exercise in a high intensity interval mode. And, and so in our high intensity interval training, we adapt it to anybody's condition and we're coaching them on an individual basis, but some of the movements are still very dynamic. So the low intensity interval training is just a just different approach to activity and movement that's starting to gain more traction with various populations. And, and I think that the clubs throughout the world are going to, going to hear more about that um, as it progresses. Excellent. I like it. If um, I might put the put the call out and say to any of our tribe out there that is currently, I guess, incorporating a, a low intensity interval training program as part of their offering. I don't know whether it'll be part of a group fitness timetable or personal training programming or, or perhaps an, a number of different areas. I'd love to hear more about it. Perhaps you could write into me at chantal at activemgmt.com.au and tell me a little bit about how it's working for your club and what type of market that you are working with on that style of training. Bill, knowing the importance of people, as we touched on earlier, do you think you could share with us some tips on hiring and interviewing people for your teams? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. The, the first thing on hiring is is really being clear that, that it's a skill set just like any other. It's not just another conversation to form a relationship with an individual. You know, when you have a candidate in front of you, there should be a structure to it. And one of the first things that, that you want to have in that structure is, is what are the traits that must be hired for that the individual already has in their possession, in their character, who they are as a person, not the stuff that can be trained. I can train somebody on technical skills, exercise testing, how to do sales presentations. I can even train people on listening, problem solving methods, you know, how to resolve conflict. Uh, how to set goals. I can train people on fitness knowledge. Those are all areas we can train people. What you can't train people on is do they have initiative? Do they have that mentality that an owner would have about a site? Do they really take that accountability? Are they adaptable? Do they think positively? You know, are they bottom line oriented and results oriented? Are they a broad thinker? And you know, can you trust them? Do they have honesty and integrity? So, so those last things I mentioned, you know, are critical that that person's got to come already with those uh, as part of who they are. And so I have to, to determine, you know, if I believe they have those traits, you know, during the interview process. So I, I want to use tools. I want to have, have questions already prepared. I want to have those things that I want to check off to make sure that I'm comfortable that person comes uh, to the organization with. So, so if you ask me that, you know, the biggest thing on hiring and interviewing it, it would be, you know, be professional about it and take it seriously as a process, not just a conversation or relationship, know what person, what the person must have, have your structured questions. We use behavioral interviewing. We use questions about past experience to try and see how they might conduct themselves in, in a future environment. You know, we ask people to, to do some type of, of writing assignment, either a couple paragraphs about their experience touring the club or, or some type of writing to see how they communicate in written format, but having that process laid out in detail. You know, there's a saying, you know, that, that if you take a, a pig and you train them to run fast, you're going to get a, a fast pig. You're never going to convert that pig to be a racehorse. So if you want to hire racehorses, you got to hire racehorses. You can't hire pigs and train them to run fast. Yeah, you know, so you really have to know what you're looking for and hire people for what they come to the table with. And that would probably be my, my initial thought on that question. And and Bill, would you say that process that you mentioned, is that the same regardless of 
which position they are applying for within the club. Are there any variations that you would apply based on position? Yes, absolutely. The questions I ask in the interview are, are there's going to be general questions that are for everybody, culture, values, uh, those kinds of things, outlook on, on life. Uh, but then I'm going to have job specific questions based on the role. And then I'm also going to have some understanding of, of positions. If I'm hiring somebody that's going to be mostly in the back of the office, maybe in accounting, that, that may be somewhat different in some of the skills that I require with regard to um, outgoing personality or ability to network with a large group of members on the fitness floor, you know, without being intimidated. So positions are also going to dictate uh, some of the, the skill set traits, but fundamentally the process is going to be the same with skills that you're looking for and the roles that you're hiring for having some modification. Now, we've explored briefly hiring and interviewing. Do you want to maybe give us some key thoughts around managing staff? One of the biggest things about managing staff that I continuously am reminded of and continuously relearn is you have to be very clear on setting the expectations. You know, what does a win look like? What game are we playing here? What are the priorities? So we use in our organization 30, 60, 90 day plans. I talked about that a year ago in the strategic planning process, but but every individual in the organization that has a deliverable using a, an ongoing 30, 60, 90 day planning process where it, it's continuous and it, and it keeps going allows people to, to have foresight into what are my immediate goals and priorities, what are my intermediate and what are my longer term, and how do I get to completion on the things I'm working on as I take on new things. So, you know, 30, 60, 90 day uh, monthly goal setting and planning, I think is critical. The biggest piece, though, as leaders in, in a people-driven organization, we should all consider is how much appreciation and recognition are we giving our team? Just like members, you know, we all have heard stats and you know, 68% of the, the members that quit a, a business are quitting because of staff attitude and difference. You know, a member just doesn't feel appreciated. Well, the same thing happens with employees. If they don't feel appreciated, if they don't feel truly respected and recognized, you're going to have higher turnover and less, uh, less enthusiasm to do a job well done. So, you know, clear goals and expectations, a plan to keep those moving forward and lots of uh, love and appreciation and recognition would be things that I would highlight. That's great advice, Bill. Thank you so much. And I might just take the opportunity to remind everyone that if you did happen to miss that a discussion on strategic planning that I had with Bill way back 12 months ago. Just jump onto fitnessbusinesspodcast.com and check out show six. That's when we discussed strategic planning amongst many other things. So Bill, I want to say a absolutely huge thank you for joining us once again on the show. I love having you back on the show. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for updating us on what you've been up to, on sharing some of those great initiatives that you're working on. Uh, thank you for allowing us to share your article which Tribe I'll be popping into this week's show notes. And I hope, do you reckon you'll you'll come back and join us again, Bill, sometime? Oh, I would love to. Yeah. Uh, Fitness Business Podcast, I'm just a huge advocate, huge fan. Uh, the content that you share, uh, it's an amazing learning tool. I've learned a lot from, from your guest. You're a true professional, and, and I just respect and appreciate what you do for our wonderful industry. Well, I would love to make it a trifecta. So uh, consider yourself invited back again. Hopefully it'd be sooner than 12 months time. And uh, thank you once again for joining us on the show, Bill. Sounds great. Thank you. Have a great day. Happy birthday. Hey, this is Lisa Mills from Lisa Mills Performance Coaching. And I want to wish the Fitness Business Podcast an enormous happy first birthday. The thing I love most about the podcast is that there's nothing else like it in the industry. And you deliver such great quality guests every single time. Two of my favorite, Michelle Seagar and Tim Keatley. I love the way that Chantel interviews all of the guests and really gets the most out of each one of them so that when then we can take home some great tips and tricks to implement into our businesses. So great work, guys. I love it and I can't wait to see what comes next. Hi, this is Max Martin from Movement Screen and Corrective Exercise Australia. I just wanted to wish the Fitness Business Podcast a very happy first birthday 
You guys have done an amazing job this last year. I have really enjoyed listening to all the speakers and reading the show notes and your key comments that you put up afterwards. Uh, and I've been really lucky to be a small part of it as well. So thank you for your support to our industry and to our professionals and businesses. And here is to many, many more episodes that I look forward to listening to. All the best and chat soon. Hi, this is Amy Dixon from Los Angeles, California. And I want to wish Fitness Business Podcast a happy first birthday. Congratulations. The Fitness Business Podcast is very appreciative of our podcast partners. Here's a quick word from one of our partners. As you know, one of our goals at the Fitness Business Podcast is to help you grow your business. So I love it when I can tell you about solutions to help you do just that. One of our podcast sponsors is Tribe Team Training, and I'll tell you exactly why you need to remember that name. Let me start by asking you three questions. Is your club struggling to grow your membership numbers because of more and more competition? Is your club under pressure to reduce membership fees for your existing members? Do you lose members who go to niche small group programs like CrossFit, boot camps and boxing, where they often pay double what they're paying with you? Well, the good news is, is that some clubs have found a new way to grow their club's revenue and profit without having to sell extra memberships. They're doing this by implementing a highly profitable small group training system called Tribe Team Training. In fact, one regional club with only 600 members takes over $200,000 per year on top of their membership fees from their Tribe Team Training program. So what's it all about? Well, Tribe Team Training is a complete small group training business system that helps clubs make more money without having to sell more memberships. Whether you're currently running small group training or not, it is worth taking the time to see what Tribe Team Training can add to your business. In fact, some clubs have grown to over 30, 40 and 50 sessions per week with members paying $10 to $15 extra per session. Most clubs have underutilized space or time that can be generating extra cash for the club, extra work for the trainers and the group X instructors, plus delivering outstanding results for members. The tribe programs work on large exercise floors and in small functional training spaces with as little as 60 square meters. You may have already have functional training equipment, but without the consistent delivery of fresh programs, it's difficult to take maximum advantage of it. Now, regardless of the success of your current programs, Tribe is offering club owners a free online briefing so you can see for yourself the difference between team training and small group training, the difference it can make to your members, the opportunities it gives to your trainers and instructors, and the extra income it can add to your club. So to register for your free briefing, all you need to do is head over to tribeteamtraining.com or tribeteamtraining.com.au. Let me tell you those addresses again. It's tribeteamtraining.com or tribeteamtraining.com.au. And of course, a copy of both of those website links will be in today's show notes. Now it's time for this week's Quick Fire 5 questions. Who's joining us this week, Chantal? Okay, Tribe, it's my absolute pleasure to be introducing you today to Lisa Simone Richards, the principal of PR agency Vitality PR and Communications in Toronto and the creator of Make Media Friends, an online PR school for health, fitness and wellness entrepreneurs. Welcome to the show, Lisa Simone. Hey, Chantel, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to share some information and drop some knowledge to your listeners today. Awesome. Now, are you ready for our quick fire five questions? Let's do it. Okay. Tell us, why do you do what you do? I do what I do, teaching entrepreneurs how to do uh, media relations for themselves because I am so, so, so passionate about helping everybody who's left their safe corporate nine to five where they're making, you know, five and six figure salaries because they found on this adventure to do what they're passionate about, to help people live with health and vitality. So I really want to support them and make sure that their businesses thrive and survive. And what's the best advice that you've ever received? Ooh, a good nugget of wisdom I got is if you aren't building your own dream, you're building someone else's. And what's a personal habit that helps you become better at what you do? I am obsessed with continuous education. So whether that's reading books, listening to audio books or listening to podcasts, I'm constantly looking for more and more knowledge. Oh, me too. I think that's a great one. And tell us what's one book that you'd recommend and why? 
I would definitely suggest that every small business owner and entrepreneur reads The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. I think a lot of us have this dream of, you know, all this freedom, but a lot of entrepreneurs find out that they really bought themselves a job. So this will really uh, change the way you focus and approach your business. And Lisa Simone, why should our tribe come back and listen to the main interview next week? Oh, they're going to want to come back because you're going to be on your way to collecting those elusive as seen on media logos for your website. Okay, Tribe, make sure you tune in next week for our main interview with Lisa Simone. You're going to love it. It's time for the Fitness Business Podcast Wrap. Here are some of my favorite takeaways from this week's show with Bill McBride. He said, always be pushing to make sure that you are evolving and growing the programs within your club to stay relevant. When we're talking about interviewing new candidates, he said, when you interview someone new, consider the traits the individual already has. Do they take initiative? Are they adaptable? Do they have a positive outlook? Are they results oriented? And do they have integrity? And when it comes to managing staff, he said, if employees don't feel appreciated, respected and recognized, then you'll have a higher turnover and less enthusiasm for doing a great job. Get ready for this week's bonus segment, your extra injection of information, education, and inspiration to strengthen your fitness business. Tribe, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome back our regular on the show. It's Liesl Kleby. Welcome back, Liesl. Good morning. How are you going? I'm very good. I'm very excited to talk to you. I'm just thinking how fast this year is going already. It's shooting along, isn't it? <laughs> it's just incredible. I can't believe we're in June. I'm um, yeah. I'm very, very excited to have you back on the show. Now, last time we caught up, uh, which was at Filex, mind you, you mentioned yeah. that we would be talking about change management. That's right. Yeah, I've had to um, deliver some fairly rapid and substantial change at Virgin Active since I've started here, and I thought it might be a good topic to touch on because... Most of us will have to deliver change at some degree at some level. So it's a really good process for me to maybe talk through my experiences and a few tips uh, for people who have to deliver change. I think that sounds like a great idea. So how about we start, perhaps you can let us know, where do we actually start when we're considering substantial change or rapid change? I think perhaps the first thing that you need to think about is what your vision is for that change because there needs to be a leader for any change and I think it's really important that you give people an idea and paint a picture of where you're going to be going together, like what is the outcome, where are we going, what are we doing and why. And then probably the second most key thing for me is just broadly and continually keep communication lines open and give people as much notice as you possibly can on the changes that are happening. Okay, so once we've identified those areas, how what are the steps to then rolling it out? Uh, I think... For most change, if you give yourself a good period of time to roll that change out, it's going to make it a lot easier on the people who are uh, having the change affect them and a lot easier on you in terms of managing that change. So what I've discovered through doing some rapid and substantial change recently is that people don't like change. <laughs> They're very, very resistant to it <laughs> and you manage quite a major fallout if you don't have a really good lead-up time in which to communicate your vision and where you're going and what you're doing and why you're doing it and really paint the big picture for them. So the first thing is to give yourself a decent timeline and then to roll out communications and paint that picture, um, show them the vision, communicate with them. If there is time and possibility for you to consult with people, um, it's a double-edged sword, but it at least lets people feel heard. But you do need to be in the position where you are prepared to do something with what you have heard from them. As you, as you say, I mean, people generally don't cope well with change. Are there any other, I guess, tips or pieces of advice that maybe you could give us when it comes to staying really responsive and, I guess, trying to maintain that relationship with members and even with your team during the process of change? Yeah, I think the really key thing for me is communication. And I Mm. think perhaps to having a really good understanding that change takes time. So you're going to need to monitor and manage that change. And be understanding about the fact that people are very resistant to it. It, it um, upsets the apple cart, as it were, mm-hmm. um, and you need to take a lot of time to listen to people and to understand where they're coming from and then encourage them in that space of open-mindedness and being open to the changes that are happening, particularly if they're positive ones, which ordinarily they are, but not in every circumstance. So I suppose recognition and appreciation of how hard it is for people to embrace those changes and then walking the walk, talking the talk and just being the leader for that change yourself. Yeah, I think that's good advice. You know, I think you've you've covered it off with those couple of 
tips? Is there anything else that you do in regards to how you approach it when people just don't like that change or when it's not well received? I suppose what I have done with the change I've delivered here is I've started really touch pointing on the goals, like why did we make the changes? And then I'm giving people very specific feedback against those goals. So three weeks out from delivering a new timetable and renovating three studios, I was able to say to them, look, here's our penetration statistics and here's our occupancy of classes and this is better than it's been in the club in five years. So we're doing the right thing. This is working and people are liking it. And then a month out from that, I've just been able to say, look, you've gone even one better. We're now another 10% up, which is now above and beyond whatever's been delivered in this club before. And we're so close to our target of occupancy that it's not funny. So I suppose I'm now just saying we're getting closer to those goals. We're, we're achieving together what we set out to achieve. So I know it's been rugged. I know it's been hard. But you're doing a great job and we're getting there. So I suppose I'm just really now keeping that accountability there and pumping back all the positive results that are happening from that change. Yeah, I can see what you're saying, that that really utilising data and information can be your friend in this situation to try and, yeah. I guess, reinforce, as you say, those goals, the, the bigger picture that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, because I, I think you can sometimes hear from the disgruntled few in terms of your membership base and there's another 5,500 who are actually extremely happy with the change, but commonly they're not the ones giving you the back. Yeah. So I think you need to just monitor and be realistic about the balance that exists there and make sure that your team or your staff delivering the change and taking on board that feedback on a daily basis are really aware of how well the change is actually working, which then gives you the significant feeling that the majority of people are actually very happy with the change. And then that helps to bolster people to continue to roll it out positively and patiently and just continue to communicate with the members. There's some great advice there, Lisa. Thank you very much for talking to us today about change management. And uh, what are you going to have a chat to us about next month? I think I'm going to have a chat about communication, my favourite topic. (laughs) I think that sounds really good. And is it going to be in relation to um, change management? In some degree, yeah, but also in relation to team management on an ongoing basis. Excellent. That sounds really good. Well, listen, thank you very much for joining us once again and we look forward to chatting to you next month. You're welcome. I'll talk to you then. To celebrate our one-year birthday, our friends at Active Management are giving everyone a free business resource download valued at $100. To get your gift, head over to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com forward slash active. You can choose from one of four resources. Don't miss out. Jump on today. That is fitnessbusinesspodcast.com forward slash active. Tribe, thank you so much for joining me once again for another week of the Fitness Business Podcast. And remember, what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Great show this week that you should be suffering DOMs, delayed onset mind soreness, as you are overloaded and that's when your mind is strengthened. You and your business have been strengthened thanks to the amazing support of our premier sponsor, Active Management. Check out www.activemgmt.com.au only if you want to strengthen your business and your leadership. Don't forget all today's links and notes are found at www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com where you can also subscribe and never miss a show and maybe win a prize. Next week is another incredible guest with Chantal, so get ready for more Fit Bizpiration. <laughs>